Om Sada Sarvagato Pyatma Na Sarvatra Vabhasate Uddhaveva Vabhaseta Svatcheshu Pratibhimbavat Sada, always, Sarvagataha, all pervading, Api, although, Atma, the self, Na, not, Sarvatra, everywhere, Avabhasate, shines, Buddhai, in the intellect, Eva, only, Avabhaseta, manifests, Svatcheshu, in the transparent surface, Pratibhimbavat, just as the reflection. The Atman does not shine in everything, although he is all-pervading. He is manifest only in the inner organ, the buddhi, intellect, just as the reflection in a clean mirror. Namaste. So, the self is within all, but it does not shine in everything, depending on the quality of the mirror. The example is often given, suppose you had a bunch of pots and all of them are filled with water. They're all going to reflect the sun or the moon or whatever light is in the vicinity. But suppose you had a bunch of pots, some are filled with water, some are filled with mercury, some are filled with other things, and they all vary in quality. Or, for example, if you go in a fun house at a carnival, they have these mirrors that are curved. Huh? and they distort the reflection in funny ways. But our minds are also like that. See, that's the point here. We went over back in the Drig Drishya Vivekaha series how the mind and intelligence and body aren't really conscious. They only appear to be conscious because the self is reflected in them to some degree. So the self is not reflected in the body very clearly. I mean, what you get instead of like a spontaneous energy source, uh, you get this machine, this clunky thing, you know, made out of meat, <laughs> which is marvelous you know, and, and amazing. But in quality, it does not reflect the pure self. The body is made of different material elements, and so it is subject to the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Now, of these three modes, the mode of goodness is the best. Krishna says that in Bhagavad Gita. That the mode of goodness leads toward liberation, it does not grant liberation because it's material. Huh? But one can manage the body in such a way that it aids the process of self-realization, self-liberation. Huh? And at least it distracts minimally from it. Like, for example, one should be healthy. One should maintain the body nicely. Why? So that disease and weakness and so forth do not become obstacles on the path of self-realization. That's why we should practice hatha yoga and get exercise and eat right and all that good stuff. Okay, but then there's the mind, <laughs> the subtle body, manomaya kosha, and vijnana maya kosha, the intelligence. They also reflect the self, but they reflect it with much better quality than the body. Still, 
the mind can be extremely distorted and weird. <laughs> you have to watch the mind every minute. That's the job of the intelligence, to monitor the mind. And when it goes off into the weeds, you know, <laughs> to go grab it and bring it back. Well, to bring it back where? To the heart, where the reflection or the, the light of Brahman is the strongest. And from there, you can get the clearest reflection. But it's still not perfect. <laughs> when we meditate, and we see light, uh, it's because the self is reflected in the intellect. The intellect is in the heart, seated in the heart. It can reach out and go here and there, but it's fundamentally, um, the example is given in the Upanishads, like a bird tied to a post with a string. He may fly this way and that way, but the string always makes him come back to the post. So in this way, you train the bird to perch on the post. So in the same way, the mind has to be trained through the use of the intelligence to always come back to Brahman, to always come back to the source, to recognize the source and serve it and worship it. See, this is Anya Bhakti. Huh? Anya means no other. So, oh, of course, we did a series on that a long time ago. <laughs> so anyway, uh, in this particular verse, we want to emphasize that even when we meditate, the phenomena that we see are part of the mind and intelligence. They're the reflective part, and they are reflecting the self that's what consciousness is. Consciousness is duality because it has a subject and an object and the act of knowing as their relationship. Uh, so it's part of duality. It's part of the material manifestation. A proof of that is that consciousness changes. Now I'm in Jagrat consciousness. I'm looking out through the senses, but... A few, an hour or two ago, I was in Svapna. I was dreaming all kinds of weird things. <laughs> and then before that, I was in Sushupti, deep sleep, in the middle of the night. And so if I get sufficient Sushupti, I feel rested. I feel refreshed. I feel good, even though I'm an old man, <laughs> apparently. The uh, Sushupti recharges the being, because it's Shiva. It's the creative locus, the zero point, the source of energy, the fundamental tension of space-time. And from that, I mean, enormous creative energy flows, enough to create the whole universe, well, many times over. <laughs> so, when we drag our petty mind and senses concerns into the Sushupti, being Shiva, being all-powerful, he creates that. And we wake up the next morning, and there we are. Wherever we go, there we are. <laughs> but that's because of the creative potency of Sushupti acting on the undigested remnants of the samskaras in the mind. So a friend of mine wrote me something about this. He says, the human mind being chidaksha, a true reflection of Brahman. No, it's not true. It's distorted. It's all covered with upadis. <laughs> I think I am a man. I am American. I am this. I am that. Huh? So the mind is not giving true reflection. The intelligence can give almost a true reflection if it is, as you say later on, uh, polished to the maximum reflection 
like the mirror of a telescope. Using the mirror of a telescope example, uh, polishing the mind would be like after you've got the mirror, the curve laid in, you know, the parabola, and you want to polish the mirror to the finest reflection, you, you start using the finer, finer grit, 400, 600, 800, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, carbon polishing powder that you use to make the thing reflective and smooth to within like, you know, a nanometer or something like that. So anyway, the Upanishads are the equivalent, and, and Vedanta, Vedanta Sutra, and especially Shankaracharya's brilliant commentary, uh, the Sariraka Bhashya. So this is the polishing cloth and the grit, the fine grit that brings the mind to the highest possible polish. Now, you cannot perceive Brahman. Brahman is imperceptible because it is the absolute and because we are Brahman. We cannot see ourself. What we're seeing, like the light and other phenomena in meditation, is just the reflection in the distorted mind and the intelligence. To the degree that the intelligence is polished, it will give a true image. So study of the Upanishads and Vedanta is recommended to give the final finish to the mind so that it accurately reflects the self. And what good is that? We can worship that reflection. And that will incline the self to reveal itself. Or to put it another way, that will remove the upadis that hide the self from vision, and it will reflect accurately in the mind and especially the intelligence, as accurately as possible. Uh, so then, yes, this is reflected in the way a person walks, the way they talk, the way they look at things, their opinions, their tastes, and so on. Because their locus, now, the thing that they measure everything with, evaluate everything, value things, is now the self. So, for example, when they see another living being, they act compassionately and try to avoid harm. You know, do no harm. That's the first Hippocratic Oath. So, do no harm, and if possible, do good. And what is good? That is also defined in the Upanishads. So, we can talk about that another time. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.